Hello. Good afternoon. This is Ken Mingo from Samsung Medical University. I will host uh, this Guangdong uh, Hong uh, Kong call, Great Bear Area Young Scholar Forum on Brain Science and Brain Inspired Intelligence. The forum is organized by Guangdong Hong Kong Macau Great Bear Area Center for Brain Science and Brain Inspired Intelligence. Under a season of exploration, integration, and innovation, we bring together nine outstanding young scientists from France, Guangdong, Hong Kong, and Macau to share their lectures on the neural mechanism of brain disease method to analyze neural structure and function and the application of artificial intelligence in research. First, let us invite Dr. Antonia Besnard from uh, Mentopelia Institute of Functional Genomics, Press. He will give our talk about neural circuit dynamics for learned defense actions. Please. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. I hope you can uh, hear me all right. Um, all right, and I'm truly honored to uh, kickstart this uh, exciting uh, symposium of neuroscience. So <clears throat> over the past 10 years, I've been very much interested in uh, the mechanisms underlying defensive behaviors. And so there's many ways uh, mammals can develop defensive behaviors. And by that, I mean that uh, defensive behaviors can be active or reactive. And so here, I take the example of the broken charger, for which um, if you're at a party and you need to make a phone call, but your uh, battery is, uh, is dead, you ask your friend for a charger uh, and they go, sure, here it is, uh, but be careful, it is broken. So you may get an electric shock. So there's two ways to go about it. Either um, you use it with the risk of receiving an electric shock, and you will therefore remove your hand whenever receiving the shock. Or like me, you choose to not touch the charger and wait for the phone call. So this is important because this uh, reflects the multifaceted components of defensive behaviors. Um, in the lab, we can actually study defensive behaviors using uh, rodents as animal models. So there's multiple dimensions by which we can analyze defensive behaviors, um, either um, spontaneous reactions, such as the looming escape. So here, a mouse in a lab has never experienced a predator before. But yet, when presenting a, a, uh, an approaching predator, the mouse will run into shelter. So this is obviously not learned. It's innate. It's a spontaneous reaction. And by reaction, I mean that no matter how fast the mouse will run, uh, this will not change the behavior of the predator. So this is opposed to learned reactions. So here, uh, the Pavlovian fear conditioning, uh, where mice will learn to associate a tone, a conditioned stimulus with a shock, an unconditioned stimulus. And so when hearing the tone, mice will uh, show freezing behavior, which is a defensive reaction. Again, it's a reaction because uh, no matter how much the mouse freezes, it will not change the onset of the foot shock. So now we have uh, defensive actions. So here I take the example of the plus maze, where there's two closed arms and two open arms where the mouse will be free to explore the different arms. And so um, this test is a traditional anxiety measurement but what we're really measuring here is the spontaneous or deliberative avoidance of the open arms. And so the animal here controls the level of threat by deciding to enter the open arms or not. And finally, we have learned actions, which again consists in the association between a turn and shock. But here the mouse will uh, be able to shuttle into the opposite side of the chamber to avoid uh, the punishment. So this is here an action because the animal will choose or not 
to uh, turn off the uh, shock. So over the past 10 years, I've been very much interested in understanding uh, the mechanisms of defensive reactions in Amar Saha's lab in, in Boston. Uh, but then again, now I'm turning into uh, uh, defensive actions because humans love to control the environment. For example, we uh, change, we control the temperature of the room and so forth. But for historical reasons, uh, the study of defensive actions has been overshadowed by uh, defensive reactions. So how do I approach uh, uh, defensive actions in the lab? I use the active place avoidance paradigm. Um, this is basically an electrified grid that will spin at one rotation per minute. And so the mouse here will be able to navigate this platform using um, stationary cues that are present in the environment. And so we use here a camera that will allow us to follow the behavior of the animal. And we will be able to uh, draw a virtual area that's associated with a uh, food shock entry. So basically, anytime the mouse will enter this zone, 60 degree uh, zone, it will receive a food shock. So this is how uh, the protocol works. We have a pre-training phase where the animal is free to explore the environment. Um, and no shock is ever uh, received during this phase. So then during the training phase, every time the mouse will enter the foot shock zone, uh, it will uh, receive a foot shock so that it will quickly learn to stay away from this foot shock zone. So obviously, sometimes they commit mistakes, uh, but this is one way to measure active avoidance in a spatial context. And finally, once the mice have learned to associate the sh shock with the zone, we can proceed to the reversal phase, which basically here, the foot shock is placed on the opposite side. So this is very interesting because you can see at first that the mouse will start avoiding the original foot shock zone, but then quickly realizes that the south, which was safe before, is now associated with the shock, but still not entering the north. And now the mouse starts reversing the behavior. So this is a very good test of cognitive flexibility. All right, so at the end of the experiment, we can draw these heat maps. So during pre-training, the mouse explores roughly uh, the same uh, all parts of the platform. During training, the mouse will spend more time in the southwest uh, of the platform um, because the platform is constantly driving the mouse into the shock zone. And during reversal, you can see that um, the uh, distribution is broader, which reflects the conflict and the confusion of the animal. All right, so what is the neural underpinning of uh, avoidance behavior in mammals? So here, uh, there's the usual suspects for defensive behaviors, the frontal cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus, which is also true uh, in mammals. Uh, the, the amygdala is found, uh, the frontal cortex, but also the nucleus accumbens. And we'll get back to this in a minute. So here, I focus on the hippocampus. Um, the hippocampus is an important brain region for uh, learning and memory spatial navigation, emotional regulation. And so here you can see a coronal section of the hippocampus in mice. Uh, in blue, you can see uh, the nuclei of all cells. And in green, you can see the principal cells of the hippocampus labeled with Thai-1 MGFP. So you can appreciate here the dente gyrus, area CA3, CA2, and CA1. And traditionally, the information is thought to flow within the hippocampus according to a proximal distal gradient. So importantly, in 2010, a study by Wang and colleagues showed that there is a decrease in the volume of the dente gyrus in CA3 in humans. And so this is important because the anatomy of the hippocampus is very well conserved across species. So this is extremely important because um, post-traumatic stress disorder is fairly uh, prevalent in the general population. About 5% of women will experience a PTSD throughout the lifespan and 2% uh, of men. So there is a dichotomy between women and men. The clusters of uh, PTSD encompass re-experiencing the traumatic event, either through uh, nightmares or flashbacks, excessive and persistent avoidance, either cognitive or behavioral, and hyper uh, arousal. So the frontline treatment for PTSD is exposure therapy, uh, which is basically uh, re-exposing the individuals to their the memory of the original trauma. 
Uh, but you can see here that excessive and persistent avoidance for which most uh, patients engage with is counterproductive because it will prevent these patients from benefiting from uh, 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 exposure, exposure therapy. So here the proposal is that we need to better understand the neural underpinning of excessive and persistent avoidance in order to help patients benefiting from exposure therapy fully. So in the literature, there's some evidence that the hippocampus and here the dentate gyrus may constrain persistent avoidance in this task. So here the authors use mouse genetics to target uh, the principal cells of the dentate gyrus with uh, halorhodopsin. So halorhodopsin is a light-gated chloride pump, which will use the energy of yellow uh, to green light in order to give way to chloride inside the neuron resulting in a hyperpolarization of the cell. So this is what happened when the authors shine the light on uh, those cells. They observed a massive decrease in action potentials, which was quickly reversed when the light was turned off. So what happened when they silenced the dentate gyrus in this task? Uh, the photo silencing of DG actually did not prevent these animals from uh, avoiding the foot shock zone as compared to the uh, control mice. But what's interesting is when they uh, actually reverse the rule, so the shock now is in the south, mice uh, learn to avoid the foot shock zone. But you can see here that they persisted in avoiding the conflict zone, the former foot shock zone, which is now safe. And this is very striking as compared to controls. So this is an indication that DG and its uh, only one uh, downstream partner, CA3, may play a role in preventing persistent place avoidance. So what may be driving the hippocampus to uh, facilitate or constrain uh, persistent avoidance? So here we focus on the nucleus accumbens because it is one of the main uh, uh, projection centered to the uh, uh, midbrain, which is important for action selection. So avoiding or not avoiding. And so, um, in the lab, Alexandre Chambard, a, uh, a master student, uh, performed the following experiment. He trained four groups of mice um, to undergo uh, act, um, active place avoidance in the training condition, the reversal condition, a pseudo-training control group never experienced the foot shock. So it was basically a uh, an exploration control and here a home cage control. So 60 minutes following uh, the behavior, the animals were uh, perfused uh, and the brains were processed for uh, immunohistochemistry. So here, Alexandre actually uh, monitored the expression of WFS1, which uh, labels very nicely the nucleus accumbens, and CFOS, an immediate gene whose expression is used as a proxy of uh, neural neural activity post-mortem. And so he quantified CFOS um, throughout the core, the medial and the lateral part of the uh, shell of the nucleus accumbens. And what he found was that there is a significant increase in the number of CFOS cells in the lateral part of the shell as compared to the other groups. So, and especially relevant for the reversal condition. So this is suggestive that the, the lateral part of the shell of the nucleus accumbens may play an important role in driving uh, the reversal of place avoidance. So now the question is, how might the hippocampus control the activity of the nucleus accumbens knowing that the amygdala or the frontal cortex do not project directly onto the nucleus accumbens? Well, here we turn to the septum because the septum is a nice uh, relay between the hippocampus and the nucleus accumbens. So the septum is composed of the lateral part in yellow and the medial part in pink. And here we'll focus on the lateral part, which is encapsulated between the striatum in blue and the cortex in green. So the lateral septum has been widely indicated in emotional behavior. Um, it is widely GABAergic, shown here with in situ for uh, VGAT, but not glutamatergic, and expresses a number of neuropeptides such as somatostatin, neurotensin, proenkephalin. Um, and is also importantly sexually dimorphic, which I think is especially relevant for the study of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And so uh, during my postdoc in Amar Sahas lab in Boston, I collaborated with uh, Ivan Makosko to uh, sequence uh, the lateral septum. And so here we uh, uh, isolated single cells 
and embedded them into uh, droplets of oil together with microbeads that are barcoded. And so we're able to obtain a deep sequencing of transcripts from approximately 30,000 cells from the lateral septum. So we're able to generate these distant plots where one dot is a single cell with a unique molecular profile, and each cell is organized based on the relative homogeneity to the uh, uh, neighboring cells. And so using this approach, we're able to revisit the chemo architecture of the lateral septum across uh, the multiple dimensions of the lateral septum, which nicely matched um, uh, the projections of uh, uh, the lateral septum. So this is especially uh, relevant and I believe will become an important tool to better understand uh, the anatomy of the lateral septum as it relates to function. And so uh, during my postdoc, I collaborated with uh, Ian Davison at uh, Boston University for slice physiology, used uh, a transsynaptic tracing approaches, optogenetic and calcium imaging approaches to show that the projection from CA3 to the lateral septum will regulate defensive reactions, freezing in a context-specific manner. So specifically, I use calcium imaging uh, in the lateral septum to target the somatostatin-expressing neurons using a calcium indicator GCAM. So here, a, a green lens was chronically implanted into the lateral septum and was attached to a, a single photon miniscope so that we can now record from uh, uh, single cells the calcium dynamics related to uh, a freezing behavior. And this in a context associated with a shock or a safe context, context B. So what you can see here is that uh, in animals that previously received a food shock in the, in the context A, there's not a great deal of calcium transients. So here you can see the calcium dynamics, uh, which are uh, either the original movie or here the pr process data. You can see that every time the mouse stops freezing, there is night bouts of uh, calcium dynamics. And so this was so faithful that we're able to use the calcium transients to train a decoder to predict the freezing onset and offset of the animal, which suggests that those SST cells may be important to calibrate uh, those defensive responses. And this was context specific. It, it did occur in context A, but not in, in a safe context B. Uh, we then use optogenetic tools to control the activity of the somatostatin neurons and show that these neurons indeed control freezing behavior, uh, thus showing uh, a necessity for these cells to uh, calibrate behavior. All right, so in my lab, I'm now proposing to continue studying this pathway as it relates to uh, relay information flow to the nucleus accumbens with regards to uh, uh, active place avoidance. And this in male and female mice. And I think this is especially important, again, uh, 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 with regard to uh, the, the amorphism for post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and we have evidence that male and female mice do not behave the same way in this task. So here, Salome Boyer, a master student in the lab, trained two groups of mice, males and females, in a five-day protocol uh, uh, active place avoidance paradigm. So each day the animals underwent 30 minutes of training, so either with a shock in the north or a shock in uh, the south. So the training phase and the reversal phase. And what Salome was able to show was that during the training phase, male and female mice can successfully avoid the food shock zone as compared to the pre-training day. So chance level is the dotted line. And then during reversal, mice commit more errors. They enter more into the food shock zone early on, but then they learn to reverse the avoidance. What is very interesting to me is what happens in the opposite zone, the safe zone. You see that both male and female mice uh, enter preferentially the opposite zone. Perhaps females enter less into the opposite zone, but this becomes even more striking upon reversal where female persists in avoiding the safe original uh, food shock zone. So this is especially relevant because, again, uh, of the dimorphism between uh, male and females uh, in post-traumatic stress disorder. So using uh, this preparation, I will use uh, live calcium imaging to decode the activity of the lateral septal neurons that project to the nucleus accumbens with regards to uh, persistent place avoidance in this task. I will then characterize the microcircuits 
linking C A three with the nucleus accumbens via the lateral septum using slice physiology. And in the future, we'll also design a uh, closed loop system to uh, prevent persistent place avoidance using optogenetic tools in a real time manner. So. All the work that I presented today was carried out in Amar Saha's lab uh, at Harvard during my postdoc in collaboration with Ivan Makosko as well as Ian Davison, but also uh, in my lab now uh, at, in Montpellier in France. Uh, here are my collaborators, Emmanuel Valjean and Stephanie Truche. Uh, I want to acknowledge Salome Boyer and Alexandre Chambard who carried out the, the preliminary experiments. I want to acknowledge my generous uh, uh, funding support um, if you want to know more about the project, you can visit this website. And I am currently looking for uh, postdocs. So uh, feel free to reach out to me directly uh, using uh, uh, this uh, media. Thank you very much for your attention. And I will be happy to take some questions. Uh, OK, thank you. Uh, because we uh, have a limited time, so we haven't done the discussion times. Sorry, oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, that's okay. So maybe next time, next time we have uh, some uh, specific uh, symposium, we have uh, uh, this discussion. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, good, good, good talk. Good talk. Thank you. Okay, let's move to next speaker. Uh, who is uh, Cao Xiong from uh, Southern Medical University? His uh, talk title is uh, "His Team Metabolic Defined Central Nuclear Circuits by Directionally Controls Anxiety Related Behavior." Please. Okay. Wait a, wait a minute. Okay, thanks Professor Gauss for the introduction. Uh, thanks the organization for giving me the opportunity to introduce our work. The title of our uh, today is a distant metabolic defined uh, circuit nuclear uh, by directional control anxiety related behavior. Uh, anxiety is a common psychiatric disease and there are about 300 million people around the world suffer from this disease and the lifetime of the anxiety uh, is the 60% and COVID-19 uh, pandemic trigger a 25% increase uh, and, uh, recently. And also, uh, anxiety is a leading cause of disability and global uh, disease burden. So anxiety is a serious uh, a global public health problem. Evidence from human, primate, and rodent study has implicated the CEA uh, central nuclear of amygdala play a critical role in the pathogenesis of anxiety. But the CA related molecular mechanism and neural circuit involved in the anxiety remain unclear. Uh, the brain is a high rich uh, pure uh, polyunsaturated fat acid, including ARA, DHA, and EPA, especially for ARA. Uh, in the ARA, A uh, ARA has been implicated uh, in regulated mood disorders such as uh, anxiety uh, mood disorder. Um, ARA can metabolize in, into the uh, biological active product uh, through the LUX, uh, cross and CYP pathway, especially in CYP pathway. And uh, then enzymes can uh, metabolize ARA into the MHET, MET. MET pathway, the key enzyme is the uh, acid at the soluble epoxy hydrate. In our previous study, we found that chronic stress can increase the, uh, the activity of the SH in the actual sign, uh, and this rather ET signaling in actual signs can uh, induce the deficiencies of the actual sign ATP release. And uh, and this uh, will induce the depression like behavior. Uh, and we can see that SCH is mostly is localized in the actual sign and the regulated depression like behavior. Uh, uh, but particularly, uh, SCH is suggests is expressed in the CA neurons. Uh, however, 
the detailed expression pattern and uh, the SHCA the functions are still unknown. So you want to roll the road of the uh, SH in the, the CA neurons, the functions are about the as <laughs> in the variety uh, to character the SH expressions patterns and the other function. We firstly explain uh, the SH antibody. Uh, we co-label SH antibody with the neuron. Uh, neurons, neuronal markers, we can see that most of the SH cells are co-label with the neuron in the CA. And then the, we uh, important SH TD tomato point nine. We can see the TD tomato uh, positive cell. They have a neuron the morphology, and about we collabor with the neuron, and we found that about sixty percent of the these the uh, positive cell were collabor with the neurons, and then the, we collabor uh, this report line signs with the actual sign uh, S one J beta. Uh, this actual size marker we found that. About the 34% of the TD tomato positive cell uh, were actual side positive. That means that mostly uh, SH positive cell in the CA are neuron. A uh, small uh, is the actual side positive cell. Okay. Uh, uh, also, uh, the SH express neuron the subtypes uh, because we know that in the CA there are uh, three kind of major GABA neurons: CIF, SOM, and PKC. Data. So we use IMS Scott. Uh, to co-label with the SH with these three kinds of the subtype neurons. And we found that uh, about uh, 30, about 70% uh, of the SH positive neurons are CF, CIF positive neurons, and 25% is strong. Okay. And the 31% uh, are the PKC that are positive GABA neurons. And then if you want to know SH in the CA, whether they involve in the anxiety. So uh, we subject the white-typed mice, the C57 mice, into the uh, array plus mate and uh, no express feeding test, MSF, and use these two uh, animal uh, behavior. We can get a uh, low anxiety subgroup and high anxiety subgroup, these two groups of animals. Uh, from these animals, we get uh, the, the there's a CAD tissue. We use the PCR to check the SHMI level. Uh, we found that, uh, in the high, uh, high anxiety subgroup, uh, there's, uh, SHMI level was, uh, lower than, uh, the low anxiety, uh, these sub subpopulations, uh, animals. Uh, more important, SHMI level was correlated with the, uh, be animal behavior, uh, this data. <laughs> I suggest that SH in the CA may be involved in the anxiety related behavior. So we directly use the uh, pharmacological study to uh, prove that whether the SH, uh, they are uh, involved in the uh, anxiety behavior. Uh, we firstly use the SH inhibitor, uh, TPPU. Uh, we use the cannula to implant, uh, by uh, laterally or, uh, unilaterally, uh, in the CA. We uh, this is a protocol. Uh, okay. Uh, as the one of uh, this uh, recovery, we are uh, doing the behavior experiments. We infusion the uh, SH inhibitor TPPU, and then the, in the behavior test, we can see that no matter one side or two sides of the infusion, in the uh, EPM test, uh, TPPU can decrease uh, the mice that is proton in open arm and increase the cotons, uh, durations, uh, in one side or two sides of infusions. In SF test, uh, the TPPU can increase the latency to three. Uh, uh, this data suggests that, uh, the SH inhibitor TPPU, uh, can produce a light behavior. Uh, and then we use, uh, because the limitation of the pharmacological study, and then we use the, uh, SH, uh, there's a, uh, SHRMA. We use this virus in jet to both two signs of the CA. And, uh, uh, from the Western broad data, we can see that, uh, this SHRMA cannot down the SEH uh, potent level. And, uh, in the behavior test, uh, they ask the TPPUs if that, uh, the SHRMA then increase the time in the open arm, increase the cost on, uh, the durations and increase the uh, latency to feed, uh, okay, in the MSF 
uh, this uh, SHM data also proved that uh, SH involving the anxiety related behavior. Uh, because uh, we just uh, uh, using the staining, we know that SH express on the neuron and the actual sign. Uh, how about the neuronal SH? So we conditional log out the SH in the C8 neurons. We use the EPI2, uh, to, uh lost pin mice and inject the AV, uh, syncrate this viral in the two sign of CA. Uh, from the Western blood, we can see that in the CK mice, SH, uh, potent level was decreased. Uh, and in behavior tests, uh, not down the neuronal SH, uh, in the CA, they can decrease the open time and increase the cost time in the EPM test and increase uh, the latency to fit in SF test. This proved that uh, not gone the SH in the neuron, in the CA neuron, they can uh, have the same effect as the HHMA and the uh, TPPU. Uh, how about the actual side the SH in the CA? So we use the EP, uh, EPS2 loss B myosin and inject IV JFAP, the quick virus into the uh, CA and not gone the uh, associated SH in the uh, CA, and we found that no behavior change uh, in the in this, no matter in the EPN test or the MS test. I think all these data uh, to show that uh, neuronal SH in the CA, but not associated SH involved in the anxiety related behavior. How about the mechanism? Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, we use the voice of recording to record the instability, the SHC, the neuron in this, uh, uh, report in the SHT tomato report line. Okay. We firstly use the TPPU. We found that, uh, TPPU have no effect, uh, in the, uh, <clears throat> the Western membrane potential or input system about the SHG positive neurons. Uh, but interesting, uh, they can decrease the brain frequencies of this SH positive neuron and also increase uh, action potential thresholds uh, uh, for these uh, SH neurons. Uh, on the other hand, how about the uh, SH negative cells uh, in this data? Uh, we can see that TBPU uh, has no effect uh, on the SH uh, negative neuron, no matter uh, uh, IMP input system, foreign frequencies, or AP thresholds. And uh, that's, uh, we inject the SH, uh, SDH, SHRMA, uh, into the, this report line. And to, uh, we found that SHRMA as TPPU, no effect on the battery memory potential input resistance, but it also can decrease the foreign frequencies and increase the action, uh, action potentials, uh, uh, threshold, uh, the data is as the TPPU's effect. Again, uh, EPPU SHMA have no effect on, uh, this SH negative neurons. Uh, because we know that, uh, SH is a key engine of the ET pathway can, uh, catalyze, uh, <clears throat> and catalyze to degrade the ET. And ET has uh, several times, including five, six, uh, ET. 7 AET, 11 12 ET, and 13 14 ET. Uh, uh, previous report have shown that 11 and 12 ET uh, can uh, reduce the instability of the C1 the primitive neurons. So uh, to test whether the SH can throw the 11 12 the ET, uh, uh, we uh, directly to treat this uh, uh, SH past neuron in these report lines with the uh, <coughs> With the 11, 12 EET and the voice are recording the data to show that, uh, this 11, 12 EVT have no effect on the IMP or input system, but, but it, it can decrease the frame frequencies and increase the AP threshold just as the SH, uh, TPPU and its SHRMA. That this data suggests that, uh, SH may throw the 11, 12, uh, ET, level to inhibit the disability of the SH neuron. We also try the other time of the ET, such as uh, 1314, 78, and find that they have no effect on these neurons. And to determine whether this neurons activity, uh, SH neurons activity then associated with anxiety. So we perform the cell type uh, specific fiber photometry 
and the EPM, we firstly, we inject our AV diode GCAM CS virus into the EPM to create the mire. We port the line. Uh, and then we can uh, and paste the <coughs> fiber in the CA. Uh, okay. And the EPM and uh, uh, in the behavior test, in the every pass may test, uh, we can see that uh, when the mice are uh, closer from the close arm to the open arm, uh, the SH pass neuron has uh, uh, increased uh, uh, calcium infractions, uh, but not in the open arm to close arm or uh, close arm to close arm or open arm to close arm. That's very funny, but we don't know why uh, he will selectively increase uh, uh, from the close arm to open arms. But this data uh, suggests that this uh, activity of the SH neurons may be involved in the uh, anxiety related behavior. Uh, so to determine the role of SH neurons, uh, whether they play a important role in anxiety, we use the chemogenetic uh, to modulate this uh, SH neuron. Uh, firstly, uh, we inject the uh, hm 3 dq this virus into the uh, EPI to create uh, mice. <coughs> and uh, uh, with the CMO, we can we found that uh, uh, with with the patch cam, the CMO can uh, um, increase induce the furring in this HMDQ expression the SH neurons. And uh, in the behavior test, uh, we can see that uh, activate these the SH neurons and uh, can increase the open arm duration and decrease the cold arm durations and uh, decrease the latency to fee in, in the MSF test. This data uh, suggests that activate these neurons can produce the uh, astrology the behavior. All about the uh, all about the uh, silent these neurons. Ah, okay. Uh, we uh, use the HM4 this uh, virus uh, and. It's <clears throat> to silence uh, these SH neurons in the EPI2 create mice. Uh, CMO can inhibit the firing of the SH here, uh, CH neurons. In the behavior test, uh, silent these uh, SH neuron can dramatically uh, decrease the overall duration, increase the close arm time, and increase the latency to free the ASF test. That means that a uh, silent this SH neuron can produce a light laid behavior. Uh, to investigate the circuit mechanism, so we first to change the SH neuron uh, as some projection. Uh, we inject the uh, AAV flat uh, JP as not as not a uh, to fixing Maruby virus in the CA and then they use the uh, <clears throat> And then they use the formal system. We found that most of the CA neurons were uh, project to the BMSD and uh, some of the uh, project to the SML debris regions. Uh, and then uh, we inject the, uh, a, we inject the virtual drivers, uh, uh, into the BMS, the BMSD, uh, of the, these, the EPI2 quick and then the bad labeled with SH neurons that the project, uh, but, <clears throat> And then back label SH neuron that project to the BMST. And then we co labeled with the PKC delta CIF and, um, from, uh, as showed in the, uh, figure 9G, we can see that, uh, about uh, half of the SH CA BMST project neurons were co labeled with the PKC delta and, uh, 20% of were co labeled with the CIF. There are no co additions between the SH uh, CA BMST projections, these cells with the SOM. Okay. Finally, we want to test the uh, function of the role of the SHCA this neuron pathway in anxiety. We use the opportunities and we inject the CHR2 virus into the CA and then the paste the, uh, <clears throat> uh, paste the fibers, uh, on the BMST uh, and then Convocal images show that uh, the this virus uh, is expressed on the uh, CA the neurons body and uh, in the uh, this axon terminal the, in the BMST. Uh, okay, uh, in the uh, EPM test, uh, when the blue the blue line uh, can stimulate uh, this the SH uh, CA BMST circuit, 
and then the increased the durations of the uh, over arm that uh, <clears throat> over arm uh, in these uh, CHR2 mice uh, suggest that uh, it can align the unshorted effect. But uh, we, uh, I'm sorry, we found to detect the effect or opportunity to this effect stimulation in the open field test and the NS test. How about the silent circuits? Okay, we used the uh, MPHR this viral to silent this uh, SHCA to BMSD this circuit this pathway. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we can see that these uh, virus expressions. Uh, okay, and uh, in the behavior test in the MF test, we can see that the yellow lines uh, can uh, um, <clears throat> increase uh, the can increase the latency to the uh, the feeding. Uh, that means that this uh, inhibited circuit can produce a uh, uh, anxiety uh, like behavior. Okay, uh, but we have uh, but this uh, op opportunity to inhibit the effect have no found in the uh, EPM test and open view test. Okay, uh, these uh, data uh, suggest that the SHCA BMC circuit is a critical route for the regulation of the anxiety related behavior. Okay, we may uh, summarize. Uh, we found that SH governs anxiety like behavior via modulation of the CASH uh, neuron excitability. And uh, this CASH neuron control anxiety related behavior. And uh, SH CABMT, this pathway can by directional to regulate anxiety related behavior. Uh, okay, acknowledgements. And Ren Jing and Lu Chenling equally to these words and uh, a regimen, these uh, findings uh, support. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. But uh, because we have uh, more, no more time, so there's no discussions. We have okay. to move to next speaker. Okay, okay. thank you. <laughs> okay, okay. So next speaker is uh, Ren Caoran from Jinan University. Uh, the title of this talk is Visual Circuits for the anti nociceptive Effects of Green Light Treatment. Please. We can't hear from you. No voice, please. Chora. Chora. Northern University. Uh, his talk, uh, his title is uh, Bring Computer Interface Technology for Patients with Disorders. Uh, Concession needs and its cleaning complications. Yes. Oh, well, thank you, Professor Gao. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, my name is Jia Kui Pan from South China Normal University. Today, I will talk about the brain computer interface of patients with disorder of conscience and its clinical application. My presentation is in four parts. The first part is the background. Due to the intensive uh, care medicine uh, rapidly developed, and the number of the patients with the DOC has increased recently years. So in uh, the patient, they were suffering from the uh, they were suffering from the uh, severed blood image. Uh, they will fall first fall into the coma, and then. Some patients may be progressed to the vegetable state VS or the UWS. And this kind of patient, they have awakened, but their awareness of themselves or the environment. And other patients, they will uh, improve to the MCS. They have the inconsistently and but the reproducible uh, consciousness. So, uh, clinical diagnosis, 
pyenosis and rehabilitation of the DOC in such gravity state has become a worldwide challenge. Uh, the clinical behavior scale is only based on the behavior observation. The patient, they will observe the patient from the, their eyes, speech, and the motor aspect. However, the entire motor function in this patient will lead to the misdiagnosis rate. 14, it is related high. So at this time, the BCI is a prior. The brain computer interface is a communication pathway without the muscles. They capture the brain signal and denote the, the user's intention and then translate to the comments. They will give the feedback, the real time the feedback to the user. So the potential use of the BCI for this DOC patient has recently been demonstrated in several studies. So uh, they also can adjust several uh, questions. For example, how to detect awareness and so on. So in the part two, we will talk about the BCI-based awareness detection. When we talk about the awareness detection, it is a very difficult test. Because suffering from the cerebral brain image injury, the brain signal of this patient is different from the healthy user. And, and their level of cognitive function is related to low. So our job is to develop the hyper BCI to improve the performance and optimize the paradigm design. In the last part 10 years, we have developed the sterile the hyper BCI for the DOC. So first, let's introduce our first attempt to detect the awareness in this challenged uh, population using a hyper BCI in the 2014. Uh, this BCI is comprised of P300 and SSVEP. So in the first step, we have to conduct a command follow and experiment. Each patient, they will ask to focus on his own photo in the wrong run. And in the round two, they will ask to focus the unfinished uh, photo. So after the two rounds, they will get an BCI accuracy. So uh, in each uh, in each the BCI experiment tray, we will see this GUI. There are two photos uh, on the screen, the left photo and the right photo. And one is the patient's own photo, and the other is the unfamiliar photo. This food photo will flicker at different frequency to evolve the SSVEP. And there are the photo frames around the surrounding the photo. So the left side and the right side photo frame will flash in a random order to evolve the P300. So in this manner, the P300 and the SSVEP will be evoked stimulatedly. So after, uh, after the filter, uh, fit it into the two detection, the P300 detection and the SSVP detection. Then they will uh, go through the data protection. And at the end, they will make a decision uh, by the John the Scott. So after the 15 trade, we will get an accuracy for each patient. And we have to assess the statistically significant of the BCI accuracy. For example, if he achieve in 15 trades and if he get correct for the at least for the uh, 13 to his and then his accuracy is higher than the 16 four and at this time we saw that he is higher than the chance level so uh, at in this experiment uh, there are three patients vs1 and mcs1 and lis1 they are achieve higher accuracy than the 16-4 in both round one and round two. So we can say that they were able to follow the comments and we can tell the doctor they have consciousness. So this is our first attempt. In the sequency uh, study, we have also developed several hyper BCI to detect the lumbar uh, possession uh, related to consciousness. Uh, first of all, we deleted a hyper BCI uh, combined the P300 and the SSVEP. And in this, uh, we found that some DOC patient, they can have the number processing function. In the second study, 
we developed the hyper auto visual BCI. And if we found that the audio visual uh, integration uh, effect for the target stimuli. So uh, we found that the better performance can be attained for the audio visual BCI than the audio only the BCI and the visual only the BCI. Uh, furthermore, we detect the emotion related the cognitive uh, function in the DOC patient. An EEG based BCI system was proposed for the emotion recognition. The patient was asked to watch the positive or the negative video corresponding to the happy and sad emotion. And three of the eight patients achieved significant or night accuracy, which shows that their emotion could be emotive and detective. And furthermore, using the state effective BCI paradise, a graphic emotive network was developed to automatically classify the brain signal. And the end of the uh, network, we will output whether or not he is a VS or a MCS. The performance, uh, the performance of this network is uh, listed in this table. As we can see, that our meta uh, attempts the superior uh, performance for the other methods in the awareness detection. Uh, furthermore, uh, we also do some visualization. We found some patterns. The first, we found that the audiovisual paradise successfully induced the emotion response of the MCS to happiness and uh, sadness. Secondly, we found that the here is the three groups of their uh, DE uh, features. We found that uh, the emotion patterns of the healthy subject and the MCS subject, they have uh, similarly patterns. However, the VS patient, they show the different patterns of the brain uh, 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 activation. So here is our funding in the awareness detection. And in the, in the third part, we will talk about the BCI auxiliary uh, diagnosis. When we talk about the BCI uh, auxiliary uh, diagnosis, we note that the current clinical methods to assess DOC patients are dependent mainly on the behavior scale. CRSR is one of the important behavior scale. Uh, this scale uh, consists of six subscale, for example, uh, ordinary, visual, motor, or the motor communication, and the arousal. They will have the uh, 23 items. So uh, for BCI, we can do the thing is that uh, we can assist the CRSR scale to diagnose the patient. So uh, we have the stimulate several uh, key items uh, in the CRSR. For example, the ordinary startle, the ordinary uh, localization, the visual fixation, visual pursuit object recognition, and the functional communication. We developed this series of hyper BCI to help the doctor for the uh, di diagnosis. So let's talk about our one uh, recent study. Uh, here we develop a low mode or the visual BCI to stimulate sound localization evaluation in the CRSR involving uh, 18 patients with DOC. So uh, in the standard CRSR assessment, in this assessment, the doctor, they will first, they will present a ring bell for five seconds. And then they will watch the patient. If the patient's head or their eyes oriental towards the direction of the stimuli, at least two of the four traits, then they will get this item soccer. So the question and the problem is the patient, they are have the uh, motor disparagement. So at this time, they always to lead to the misdiagnosis. So for the BCI, we use the BCI to assist in the clinical diagnosis. Uh, we first, we will uh, give them a cue by the ordinary uh, stimuli, ordinary stimuli, and then 
we will present the sterile or the visual stimuli. So the BCI is used to detect the brain response to the directionally or the racial stimuli, and then we will get the results. So uh, in the in the in this study, we found that there are uh, 18 patients. They will divide it into three the group for the responsive group, and the patient was identified as sound uh, localization response for both CRSR and the BCI assessment. And for the non-response group, this seven patient, they were detected as unresponsible for both these two assessments. However, the most important thing is we found that something is inconsistent. It means that this seven patient, they were detected disabled, uh, unresponsible for the CRSR, but we use BCI, we can detect it the responsible for the uh, sound localization. So these seven behavior uh, patient, we found that three of them, they have improvement in the next three months. And even some patient, one patient, they will recover it to the EMCS state. So this is the first thing. And the second thing, we, uh, we, we visualize the ERP component. We see that the ERP for the inconsistent patient, these seven patients, they showed a uh, MMM light and the P300 light component, which is similar to the responsive patient. So we can see there are some similar pattern in the ERP. Furthermore, we exploded the ERSP and the ITPC patterns for the non-responsive uh, group. We found that for the healthy group, responsive group, and the inconsistent group, this three group, they will have some similar pattern. However, for the non-responsive group, they will show the significant difference from the other group. So this is our finding in this study. Uh, in the next study, we also detect uh, the other thing. We also explored the yes or no the communication uh, using an a sequence, a BCI, using the dynamic stop strategy. And we also using a BCI, using a 3D stimulate for the object uh, vaccination. So uh, we, we, we can find that, uh, first of all, the hyper BCI can really assist in the assessment of the key items in the clinical CRSR scale. And the second thing is that the combination of the CRSR and the BCI assessment method may yield more sensitive and objective diagnosis. And for one thing, we found something interesting. We found that if the patient, they can use the BCI, so they are, have the better recovery than the patient who cannot use the BCI. So we come to the fourth part, BCI basis recovery diagnosis. Uh, when we talk about the diagnosis, we have to uh, introduce one subset of the DOC patient. It called the CMD, the connective and motor isolation. It means that this patient, they cannot detect it responsible in the CRSR because they are motor is disabled. However, using the neural imaging technology such as the BCI, we can detect that they are brain activation. So they are connective function. So for this CMD patient, we our job in this study is to uh, exploit that whether or not the CMD patient have better recovery than the non-CMD patient. So uh, in this study, we use the free, it was free uh, hyper BCI that we described, uh, the, that we described above. So this free uh, BCI is used to awareness detection. So our, our series is that if the BCI accuracy is significant higher than the chance level, and then we, we did this patient will identify as the CMD patient. If not, they will identify as the potentially non CMD uh, patient. So this is the first thing. And the second thing, we enrolled the 17A, the DOC patient and 14, 
14 5 is the VS and the 13 3 is the MCS. Uh, each patient, they will suggest to two periods of the CRSR assessment. One is in the one week before the BCR experiment, and the second is in the three months after the BCI experiment. So uh, the evolution criteria is that considering the difference for the different uh, conscious state, for the VS, for the VS patient, if they get an upgrade in the level of the consciousness, for example, they change their state from the VS to the MCS, we send that he has the improvement. If out any upgrade, the patient will identify as the no improvement. For the MCS patient, if they get an increase in the CRSR score, they will uh, send as they are have uh, improvement. Without any increase, they will believe they have no improvement. So in this series, we will analyze the data. So each patient, they will uh, choose one of the three paradigms uh, by their family member uh, based on the patient's theory and the uh, ordinary and visionary uh, function. So after all, they will perform the uh, 15, uh, 15 uh, trace for the BCI experiment and then we will get the BCI accuracy. So here is a patient. He is uh, to identify as the VS patient for the CRSR scale. However, this patient, they can use their breast signal to use our BCI system. You can see that we, uh, he, he, can, he can use this BCI to do the command the follow and they can, uh, they can choose their own photo or the unfamiliar photo uh, just using their breast signal. So in this situation, he get an accuracy of uh, 172. So it's higher than the chance level. And we talk to the doctor that he is conscious. So the interesting is that after three months, this, uh, this patient has recovery to the EMCS. And even more, they can move. They can move by himself and even they can speak. So, uh, this is uh, our finding. So, for this uh, 17 8 patient with DOC, we find that there are 13 4 the CMD patient and the 14 4 non CMD the patient. And the sensitive is the uh, 17 5. So, of the 20 uh, patients who have gained the who have uh, the improvement in the consciousness, uh, 15 of them is the CMD patient. And for the 25 who has no improvement, uh, the 22 is the non-CMD patient. So the specificity is the 18A. So uh, they are combined together. We found that uh, our BCI indicator has the, a good performance. The prediction accuracy is about uh, 18 2 which is uh, better than the other index. And furthermore, we found that the BCI accuracy could be used to effectively to detect the converted conscious in CMD patient and to predict the conscious recovery. This proposed BCI would allow the condition to predict the likelihood of the improvement. So for one day, hopefully, the BCI will do a lot of more than for the patient with the DOC. And this is brand to the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for the listening. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, we have a time to the discussion. So next, uh, uh, also, we return to uh, Professor Ren Cao Ran. Okay, uh, sorry everyone, uh, uh, our good, uh, good topic. Okay, today I will talk about uh, our recent finding regarding a uh, circuit for the antineceptive effects of bright light treatment. Talking about light, uh, we know that light signals transmitted by the retina could be used to form vision. In addition, uh, changes of light uh, in the environment can also modulate many non-visual functions. Uh, including mood, circadian rhythm, cognition, etc. And the clinical studies found that exposure to a uh, bright light can uh, improve the pain-related symptoms in many patients. 
However, the uh, mechanisms underlying the uh, effects of light on, on pain are largely unknown. So my PhD student, uh, Hu Zhengfang, is very interested in this, in this question. And here she uh, used the mouse as a model to uh, determine the effect and the mechanism of bilateral treatment on pain-related behaviors. And first, she found that uh, some neurons located in the ventral part of the latter geniculate uh, ventral gene, in short, can directly project to the PEG. The ventral gene is a well-known brain region which can receive direct projections from the retina. And the PEG is, is very important for the regulation of pain-related behaviors. So this ventral gene to PEG pathway might uh, may be uh, able to regulate some pain-related behaviors. And because this pathway is novel, so uh, next she tried to, to, to determine uh, the morphological and uh, physiological property of this pathway. And to uh, identify the uh, neurons uh, located in this pathway, uh, first she used uh, anti-grid or, or retrograde tracing technique to specifically label neurons located in the ventral gene and PEG. And she found that uh, in, the vin in the media and the lateral part of the ventral gene, some gamma neurons can directly project to the PEG. And the, in the PEG, a subset of gamma neurons can receive a direct projection from the ventral gene. So ventral gene gamma neurons can directly synapse onto PEG gamma neurons. And in addition, she also proved the downstream targets of this pathway. So she specifically labeled the PEG neurons, which can receive direct inputs from the ventral gene. And she found that those PEG neurons can directly project to uh, some brain regions uh, related to pain regulations, including the locus and the uh, rostral ventral media uh, mandula. So uh, those results further suggest that this ventral gene to PEG pathway might be important for the regulation of pain-related behaviors. And next, she tried to, to determine the uh, physiological property of, the, of this pathway. So she used optogenetics to specifically activate the ventral gene to PEG projections. And she recorded the blue light evoked post currents in PEG neurons. And she found that activation of the ventral gene to PEG projections are mainly evoked inhibitory post currents in PEG gamma neurons. And those currents could be blocked by TTX and recovered by 4AP. So those results indicate that when charging neurons can inhibit PEG gamma neurons through direct projections. And this is the in vitro data. And next, she wondered whether the uh, activity of the ventral gene can also modulate uh, the neural activity in the PEG in behaving animals. So to test this possibility, she used the fiber photometry to uh, record the calcium signals in PEG gamma neurons. And uh, simultaneously, she uh, used the chemical genetics to activate the ventral gene neurons. And she found that the, uh, the PG gamma neurons can be activated by some pain-related stimuli, including uh, foot shock and uh, a hot plate stimulation. However, when she used the chemical genetics to activate the ventral gene neurons, the uh, excitatory effects of pain-related stimuli on PG gamma neurons were significantly reduced. So those results indicate that even in behaving animals, activation of the ventral gene can still be able to inhibit the PG gamma neurons. And because the changes of the neural activity in the PG is very important for the reg regulation of pain-related behaviors. So next, she wondered whether specific activation of the ventral gene to PG pathway can also modulate other forms of pain-related uh, pain behaviors. So to test this possibility, she conducted two experiments. First, she used the chemical genetics to specifically activate the PG projecting ventral gene neurons. And she found that short term activation of those ventral gene neurons elevated the pain thresholds in white type of animals. And the long term activation of the uh, PG projecting ventral gene neurons can decrease or, or improve the pain related symptoms in the CFA model and CCI model. So activation of the ventral gene can produce the antinoceptive effects in mouse. And next, to further confirm the contribution of the ventral gene to PG pathway in the regulation of pain-related behaviors, 
she used chemical genetics to specifically inhibit the PG neurons, which can receive direct inputs from the ventral gene. And because she found that activation of the ventral gene can inhibit PG, so to mimic the effects of uh, activation of the ventral gene to PG pathway, here she used the chemical genetics to directly inhibit the PG uh, postnatal neurons. And she found that inhibition of the PG postnatal neurons not only elevated the pain thresholds, but also reduced the pain-related behaviors in CFA model and CCI model. So combining the results drawn from the postsynaptic and postsynaptic post experiments, we concluded that specific activation of the ventral gene to PG pathway is sufficient to produce the antinoceptic effects in mouse. As I mentioned earlier, the ventral gene is a visual related brain region and it can receive direct projection from the retina. So next, we wondered whether there were some retinal gang cells in mouse which can directly synapse onto the uh, ventral gene to PG pathway. And to test this possibility, uh, we used a rebus virus-based biosynaptic retrograde tracing technique to specifically label neurons located in the retina, which can directly synapse onto the ventral gene to PG pathway. And we found that uh, some retinal gang cells were labeled by the rebus virus. And those cells have very unique morphological and uh, Theological properties. For example, we found that uh, the majority of the rebus virus labeled retinal gang cells uh, could express SMS2, uh, which is the marker for the so-called alpha type retinal gang cell. And uh, in addition, we tested the light response property in some of the rebus virus labeled retinal gang cells. And uh, we found that all the recorded uh, retinal gang cells could be activated by bright light stimulation. So those results indicate that some untapped retinal gang cell can directly synapse onto the ventral gene to PG pathway. And because it's uh, well known that activation of the retinal gang cells uh, mainly induce the release of, uh, of exciting neurotransmitter glutamate. So our finding also suggests that bright light induced activation of the retinal gang cells might be able to activate the ventral gene to PG pathway and finally leads to the change in pain-related behaviors. And next, to test this possibility, uh, we conducted a series of experiments. First, uh, we want to know whether specific activation of the ventral gene projecting renal gang cells could also modulate pain-related behaviors. So we use the chemical genetics to activate those renal gang cells, and we found that Activation of the ventral gene projecting renal gang cells also elevated the pain thresholds and improved the pain-related symptoms in the CFA model and CCI model. So activation of the renal gang cells can produce the antinoceptic effects. And next, we tried to uh, prove the effects of bright light on the, on the neural activity in the ventral gene to PG pathway and uh, uh, also on the pain-related behaviors. So first, we use the far photometry to uh, record the uh, uh, neural activity in PG gamma neurons. And we found that exposure to bright light can inhibit the neural activity in PG gamma neurons. And also bright light can reduce uh, the excitatory effects of pain-related stimuli on the uh, PG gamma neurons. So bright light can inhibit PG gamma neurons. And next, we want to know the effect of bright light treatment on the pain-related behaviors. So we exposed the mouse to a uh, bright light treatment, and we found that short-term exposure to bright light treatment uh, elevated the pain thresholds in the white of animals in an intensity-dependent manner. And the long-term exposure to bright light treatment decreased the pain-related behaviors in the CFE model and CCI model. So our results indicate that even in mouse, bright light treatment can produce the antinoceptic effects. And in addition, we also tested the, the effect of bright light treatment on the uh, intrinsic physiological properties uh, in the ventral gene to PG pathway. And we found that light treatment can increase uh, uh, the excitability of uh, PG projecting ventral gene neurons, but decrease uh, the excitability of PG gamma neurons. So those findings indicated that uh, bright light treatment not only can decrease pain-related behaviors, but also can modulate the neural activity in the uh, ventral gene to PG pathway. 
And finally, we want to know the uh, contribution of the retina to ventriligin to PG pathway in the antinoceptive effects of bilateral treatment. So first, we use the chemical genetics to specifically inhibit the ventriligin projecting renin ganglion cells during bilateral treatment. And we found that inhibition of the renin ganglion cells significantly impaired the antinoceptive effects of bilateral treatment. And in addition, we also use the chemical genetics to inhibit the ventriligin to PG pathway during that treatment. And we found that inhibition of those, this pathway abolished the antinoceptive effects of bilateral treatment. So taken together, our data strongly suggests that activation of the retina to ventriligin to PG pathway is required for the antinoceptive effects of bilateral treatment. Okay, uh, this is our story. To summarize, we identified a, a visual circuit which can mediate the antiseptic effects of bright light treatment. And we found that bright light can activate a subset of untabulated gang cells, which in turn can activate the ventriligin to PG pathway and finally leads to the improvement of pain related symptoms. Okay, uh, finally, I would like to thank my uh, collaborators, including Professor Su Guohui, Huang Lu, Li Haohong, Hu Ji, Shang Songping, Tao Qian, and Dr. Ling Song. And uh, uh, most importantly, I would like to thank the very talented students uh, uh, in my lab. Okay, thank you very much. Gosh. Hello, Professor Go. Okay. Hey, thank you for your talk. Okay, uh, thank because you. we haven't time to discuss your talk, so uh, you you are talking close here. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, let's we move to another uh, another uh, speaker. Li Changling from Guangdong Institute of Intelligence Sciences and Technology. Uh, the title of this talk is uh, Fibroblastic SMOC2 Surprises Mechanical Nociceptive Inhibition of Inhibiting Carbon Activation Primary Sensory Neurons. Please, Dr. Li. Hello, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, today, I would introduce a work about the function of DRG fibroblaster in maintaining mechanical pain sensitivity. Uh, we all know some station is mediated by primary sensory neuron. Primary sensory neuron is located in dorsal root ganglion. The axon of a DRG neuron has two branches, one projecting to the periphery, the other projecting to spinal dorsal hole. This is a section of a mouse DRG, show the different type of DRG neuron. RB4, NF200, CGRP are three different classical markers. Besides sensory neuron, there are other type of cells in DRG, including schwannal cells, Satan glial cells, fibroblasters, and other cells. Schwann cell and Satan glial cells are well exploited. However, fibroblasters in peripheral nerve systems are ignored. Fibroblasters are the most common cells of connective tissues. Key function of fibroblasters include 
extracellular matrix secretion and the remodeling, secretion of signaling factors for surrounding cells, mechanical force generation, and so on. These are representative genes in fibroblaster. One is SMOKE2. SMOKE2 is a member of Spark family. Previously, we investigated the function of polystyrene like one in DRG. Polystyrene like one is also a member of Spark family. Polystyrene like one is expressed by DRG neuron and could inhibit sensory transmission in spinal dorsal hole by activating sodium potassium pump. Thus, we want to explore the function of SMOC2 in DRG. First, we examine the distribution of SMOC2. Eye scope in situ hybridization data showed that SMOC2 was distributed in non-neuronal cells surrounding DRG neurosoma. Immunolabeling data showed that SMOC2 was not expressed in DRG neuron labeled by IB4, CGRP, or NF200. SMOC2 was colorized with PTGF alpha. PTGF alpha is a marker of fibroblaster. Uh, to identify the relationship between cetal glial cells and the fibroblaster, we co-stand with their marker, FIBP7 and the SMOC2. We can see DRG neurosoma was surrounded by FIBP7 positive cetal glial cells. Outside cetal glial cell, SMOC2 positive fibroblaster encircled a DRG neurosoma and is attached cetal glial cells. This data suggests that fibroblaster could further obstruct the connection of adjacent DRG neuron mediated by cetal glial cells. As a member of SPARC family, SMOC2 should be a secret protein. We captured the DRG fibroblaster and uh, examined the SMOC2 in cultural medium. And the West Bloss data showed that the level of SMOC2 in the cultural medium was increased as time went on suggesting a spontaneous secretion of SMOC2 from fibroblasters. The cell surface protein was precipitated by surface biotination. The data showed that SMOC2 tends to adhere to the plasma membrane of the time. Collagen 4 is a marker of basement membrane. SMOC2 was co-localized with collagen 4 outside the diagonal soma. Thus, SMOC2 is secreted to be a component of the basement membrane. Next, we exploit the physiologic function of fibroblastic SMOC2 in somatostation. We obtained the SMOC2 knockout mice. The true PCR data showed that SMOC2 MI was undetectable in the knockout mice. Next, uh, we examined the, the behavioral responses, include, including the receptive response, motor activated, and the itch sensation. In the one free test, the receptive mechanical threshold was remarkably reduced in the knockout mice. However, the Hargus hot plate and the Telflick test showed that the loss of smoke 2 did not affect the response latency of knockout mice to noxious heat stimuli. In the row to row, open field test showed the, the knockout mice did not have obvious defects in motor ability. Far mining test showed the knockout mice did not have obvious defects in acute pain response. Furthermore, the knockout mice did not exhibit obvious defects in each behavior induced by histamine, serotonin, chloroquine. Since we used knockout mice, not a conditional knockout mice, we further determined whether behavioral phenotypes was caused by a specific loss of SMOC2 in the DRG. We directly inject SMOC2 SRNA into the NAMP DRG 
the qPCR data showed the lockdown efficiency of smoke 2 SNI. And the behavioral test showed that mechanic threshold was significantly decreased after smog 2 lockdown. Meanwhile, the response latency to noxious heat stimuli was not changed. Uh, thus, fibroblastic smog 2 in the DRG specifically contributed to the receptive mechanical sensation. Since smog 2 knockout mice showed the mechanical hypersensitivity and the normal condition, we examined the, the morphological change of DRG. The number of PDGF alpha positive fibroblasts in the DRG was not changed, and the loss of smog 2 had no effect on the distribution of certain glial cells. Smog 2 functioned as a component of basement membrane. Then we examined the expression of collagen 4 in the DRG of knockout mice. And the notion of clustered neuron referred to or more DRG neurons surrounded by collagen 4 and uh, smoke 2. In white type mice, most neurons were surrounded by collagen 4 positive basement membrane. Only about 20% of neurons were clustered together. And in knockout mice, the percentage of clustered neurons was increased to 44%. Previous report showed that the adjacent DRG neuron tends to be activated together through increased cell communication after peripheral uh, inflammation or low injury. Since smoke 2 deficiency leads to the increase of clustered neuron in DRG, we considered that clustered DRG neuron might be activated together. Then we inject we connected AAB expressing GKM6 into the DRG. Then we performed the in vivo DRG Kesson image to monitor the neuronal activity after the application of the receptive stimuli to the hard core. And the neuronal coupling was defined as a simultaneous activation of two or more adjacent DRG neurons. And the statistic data showed that less than 10, 20 percentage, 20 percent of activated DRG neuron in responded to the set mechanical stimuli displayed a coupled activation in white type mice. Notably, more than 40 percent of activated neuron were coupled in knockout mice. Comparatively, the percentage of coupled DRG neuron in respond to noxious heat stimuli in knockout mice was similar to that in white type mice. Thus, loss of smoke 2 caused an increased coupled activation of adjacent DRG neuron responding to the receptive mechanical stimuli. To further determine the role of SMOG2 in coupled neural activation, we inject SMOG2 protein into the DRG and evaluate the effect. In vivo Kesson image showed that many simultaneous activated neurons were decoupled after the injection of SMOG2. Uh, this data suggests that fibroblastic SMOG2 is required for inhibition coupled activation of adjacent DRG neuron. We further explored the mechanism underlying the effect of SMOG2 on coupled neuronal activation in DRG. Previously study, previous study showed that synaglial cells communicate with other cells or their enveloped neuron through gap junction. Then we examined whether the SMOG2 could Intact with connexin 43, an important component of gap junction in central glial cells. And the core IP data showed that SMOG2 did not intact with connexin 43. P2X7 could be a candidate. P2X7 is known to be highly expressed in central glial cells and could regulate the communication between DRG neuron 
and they attached the nuclear cells. Last, we examined the, the possible interaction between SMOG2 and the PTX7 by CoIP. Data showed that SMOG2 could interact with cytoclear PTX7, both in cosine cell co-expressed SMOG2 mic uh, PTX7 flag and in the analysis of mouse DRG. In hex expressing PTX7, the specific antagonist of PTX7 could significantly inhibit ATP-induced calcium influx, and SMOG2 has a similar inhibitory effect. We then investigated whether SMOG2 participated in PTX7 mediated relation of neuron coupling in vivo. The application of either SMOG2 or the specific antagonist could attenuate the coupling of activated neuron in SMOG2 knockout mice. And however, the inhibitory effect was not enhanced by co-injection with SMOG2 and the specific antagonist. This data implied that SMOG2 and the PDX receptor are in the same pathway regulating neuronal coupling. After we explored the physiological function of SMOG2, we want to know whether SMOG2 has function in pathological pain. First, uh, we used a CFA model. Our scope showed that the number of SMOG2 punctor around DRG neuron was decreased after peripheral inflammation induced by CFA. The level of SMOG2 MI or SMOG2 protein was also decreased in DRG after peripheral inflammation. Double immunostanding with SMOG2 and the FIPP7 showed the, the fluorescence intensity of SMOG2 was decreased among adjacent cast the DRG neuron after peripheral inflammation. As a control, the fluorescent intensity of FIPP7 was not changed after uh, peripheral low injury, uh, peripheral inflammation. And furthermore, we examine the effect of peripheral inflammation on the basement membrane in DRG. Double immunostanding with collagen 4 and SMOG2 showed that the clustered neuron, the percentage of clustered neuron in the DRG was significantly increased after peripheral inflammation. Consider the, the CFA induced neural cluster and the regulation of SMOG2 in coupled activation. One considered that SMOG2 could reverse the increased coupled activation of DRG neuron after peripheral inflammation. After the injection of SMOG2 into the DRG of CFA mice, uh, the percentage of coupled activating neuron was significantly decreased from 44% to 20%. That's all. Summary. We find that fibroblaster secreted SMOG2 could regulate uh, mechanical reception. SMOG2 suppress coupled activation of adjacent DRG neuron through the uh, through inhibition PTX7, and the SMOG2 is involved in uh, mechanical anodynia after peripheral inflammation. And I want to thank uh, Professor Xu Zhang and the Professor Nanbao. Uh, PhD student Shuo Zhang performed the most of the experiment, and, and I want to give my thanks for the financial support from NSFC and others. That's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your nice talk. Uh, due to there's no more time, so we just have having the discussions. Thank you. Uh, so next speaker is. Uh, uh, Dr. Li Xiaojie from Shenzhen Institute of Advanced Technology. Uh, his talk title, The New Toolchain Development for Brain Machine Interface Study in Animal Model. Please, Dr. Li. Yeah, yes. 
Can you hear me? Hello? Okay, let's get started. Uh, okay, good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Li Xiaojian, and I'm from Shenzhen, Institute of Advanced Technology, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me to share our research here. And in this page, there's a video of a macaque in a high channel, flexible electrode array implanted in the brain. It's training a task of foot grabbing with both hands. Uh, I focus uh, on developing animal based brain machine interface. Macaque, as an intelligent non human primate, is a very good subject to conduct cutting edge study of implanted brain machine interface technology. Uh, okay. The picture on the left of this page is a cam model with a monkey skull model below, and it needs to be fixed to the skull uh, because we try to implant hundreds to thousands of channels of neural sensor into a multiple brain region and transmit the collective neural signal in a high bandwidth, made a lot of electronic devices that wired plug on the head of the animal. And a pretty big shield outside is needed to protect this electronic circuit. What we show here are devices for scientific research and is of use in the lab is primary because we pursue high throughput access to fine neural information from the brain. A lot of sensors need to be implanted in the brain and their electronic circuits outside will be big. So the size of the protective cap will be even bigger. Why do we pursue the access to high a throughput neural information, I need to start from my scientific research history in neurophysiology. Okay, here when I was a graduate student at the Institute of Biophysics, Chinese Academy of Sciences, I started in neuro, uh, neuroscience, uh, specifically viral physiology. I wanted to inspire pattern recognition of artificial intelligence by studying the viral system of animals. Unfortunately, we used to record neurons in the brain with glass coated tungsten electrode, which gave us very little brain information. And now we all know that intelligence is the output of neuron groups of neural networks. Uh, the recorded activity of a dozen of neurons can now tell us how the biological neural system generates intelligence. Right? So, but we couldn't do better. At that time, the neural electrophysiology data acquisition system in the lab only can record at most 16 channels uh, simultaneous. So I believe that only a high throughput acquisition of a large amount of, of neural activities can help interpreting brain intelligence and greatly inspire the artificial intelligence. So I joined the Professor Joe Chan's lab at Medical College of Georgia in the USA. We studied the formation uh, of memory by collecting neural signals in the large scale. When I started the experiment, we inserted a bundle of microwire electrodes into the mouth brain. The wire electrodes with connector is not very small. Normally, only 120 channels can be inserted into the mouth brain. And we need to hand the balloon onto the head stage. The high density of micro neural electrodes suddenly became more important than the high channel of count data acquisition. And the neural anatomy study tells us that the brain has complex structure of brain radius. Our neural information is transmitted and processed between our visible brain radius. Therefore, we can evaluate and analyze the information flow in the brain by tracking the physical projection of the neuron, which is the study of functional neural circuit. Since the amount of neural electrodes that can be implanted in the brain is limited, I think it should be implanted into the nodes of the stream of a particular neural circuit. The information processing in the brain can be analyzed based on the simultaneous recorded activities of the uh, neuronal groups in these nodes. But I couldn't imagine what a neural circuit was like. Then I joined a lab specializing in the structure of neural circuits, the Gordon Shepherd Lab of Fenberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University. There, I started using optogenetic techniques as a tool for actively detecting the neural projections. In the lab, I built a laser scanning photo simulation system with multi-channel electrophysiology acquisition, combines optogenetics and extracellular electrophysiology to study functional neural circuits. And I also built a two-photon microscope for in vivo neural 
imaging. The one and figure is an upgrade version of wide field imaging in my current SAT lab. Here, uh, what I like to mention here is a very innovative wireless addressable photo nano based non genetic neural modulation method that I tested in mice. A neuron can discharge but also can be regulated by electrical field. I collaborated with Jiang Yuanwen, who discovered a silicon nanostructure uh, with high photovoltaic conversion rate. We use this silicon structure as an energy conversion medium for photo driven neural activation experiments which was subsequently published in Nature Biomedical Engineering. Although both of the genetics and the photo nanoparticles achieve photogen showed neural activation, the biological principles are different. But from the point of view of biophysics, it's a form of energy which is not easily accepted by cells transduced into its easily accepted form. And the external information is received and processed by nerve cells. Here, after I moved back to China and joined the Shenzhen Institute of Advanced Technology, I started collaborating with Professor Sheng Xing of Tsinghua University and kept working on non genetic photo energy transducer technology. When I was at Northwestern University, the neural modulation mode I tried was a transient activation uh, that required a high power photo energy input. At this time, the collaboration with Sheng Xing is to explore and verify two directions. One is that neurons in the brain have less transient firing rates, uh, which is uh, often sustained firing with low firing rates. We need to find a way to induce the neurons into this firing mode. Second, the neural system is in a balance of excitation and inhibition. <clears throat> they had developed the method of exciting neural activities, and the inhibiting is also needed because the real modulation have the ability of both positive and negative potential. And it's another paper accepted by Nature BME. Okay, here we kept using the membrane structure and we succeeded in using the two devices to activate and inhibit the culture cells by testing the neural effects. Oh, also, we tried the in vivo experiments. The first one, were to modulate the psychic nerve of mouse, and we can clearly see the modulated movement of the lab, right, from the picture. Okay, finally, we tested them in the mouse brain. And again, the cortex was activated and inhibited, proven by the electrophysiology data. Okay, <clears throat> in addition to novel methods such as remote neural control, traditional methods are also being given new life. Uh, for example, from the part of the neural system, implanted neural sensors that penetrate brain tissue are definitely invaders. Galea tried to isolate these aliens and neurons. Another implantable sensor is applied to the surface of the cortex. For example, uh, EQG electrode. Implants at this location are impacted with this as an extended layer of the cerebral cortex especially in the application of brain machine interface. The penetrating style neural sensor, although sensitive, may be rejected by many people. However, the amount of information obtained by the, the EEG of collecting signals from the scalp is very low, mainly because the skull and the scalp form a low path filter and fill out the high frequency neural signal with rich information. And the, the sensor attached to the scalp is greatly disturbed by the ambient noise. So the signal to noise ratio is very low. The EQG emerged as a compromise. Implantation is relatively simple. The process does not destroy the cortical structure of the brain, and the sensor is close to the neuron, which is detected to obtain signal with high quality neural activity. The detail is discussed in our invited review paper. Uh, the, the traditional neural electrical signal sensor is made of inert metal and collects the voltage signal produced by neurons. Neurons live in iron environment filled with accelerator matrix, and the signals sent by neurons are also the form of iron flow. If the sensor surface has the function of resigning iron similar to accelerator matrix, it's likely to enhance the capacitive sensing of the iron. 
it has been reported that coating the surface of the micro EKG electrode with PDOT can significantly improve the quality of sensing neuroelectric signals. I and Professor Luo Zhiqiang from Huazhong University of Science and Technology continue to promote this direction uh, of research. This product was designed very conductive and adhesive material to help bond the PDOT onto the metal surface, especially the gold surface. And we can see that the mechanical stability and the electrochemical stability of the bonding materials are improved a lot. Here, then we use the material to help fabricating the micro EKG electrode, and the electrode is proven of capturing the sensory information, which has the potential to be used in BMI development. Okay, now we are back to the first page about the monkey. Both techniques mentioned above were functional validation experiments performed on mice. These experiments are relatively simple, mainly to test the physiological e efficiency of the developed devices. Experiments with monkeys are much more complex. At least the steady acquisition of large amount of neural information need to be ensured. This video on the right shows the validation experiment of collecting neural signals from an anesthetized macaque after a high channel point neural sensor array was implanted in the brain. The raw signal displayed online can be seen from the laptop screen. The electrode array and the acquisition sieve are running good. Okay, here we simply append the two changes displayed in the previous page video. From that right, neural sensors, which can collect neural electrical signals, the neural electronic front end transforms the analog form of neural electrical signals into digital signals. The neural signal acquisition device acquires a multi channel neural signal collected by each front end board parallelly and thus pre pre processing and then package and forward the data to the host computer, such as a PC or a server. The host computer run control and realization software, in some cases, decoding software. In the experiment shown here, the sensor array is a penetrating flexible electrode array with over 1,400 channels. The data acquisition and device can be supported parallelly. Uh, and uh, uh, more than 2,000 channel signals continuously. The bandwidth is over 100 megabytes per second. Okay, as a sensor example, I will briefly uh, introduce this microelectrode array we designed, named Cortex Zero. Uh, it's mainly a grid of polymer insulated flexible neural sensors with a PCB connector. The model tested the monkey that have 128 sensors distributed with a 3 millimeter multiplied 5 millimeter area. Another model used for clinical scientific research is much bigger. Okay. When we uh, fed the monkey and the video day, we can see the uh, micro EQG power spectrum correlated uh, with the grabbing and the eating. Okay, connected to this sensor is the electrophysiological front end board. Uh, currently, we have developed two models. Model A has 128 channel and uh, 256 channel version. The onboard chips feature uh, Intel chips. In the top feature picture on the right, the 128 channel front end board has a wanted over the original front end board of Intel in SNR. Model B is feature iMac. 384 channel IC chip, which is the IC core of the NeuroPixel Pro. So here we tried using <coughs> NeuroPixel Pro version one to record a monkey brain signal, but this type is not good for chronic recording uh, due to the fragile shaft. So we lost data later. Okay, we also have developed our own IC chip of bidirectional neural signal sensing and stimulating for a closed loop on your modulation. We have just finished the, the onboard test with excellent performance. Uh, hopefully, uh, we're working inside uh, high-trick uh, modulation experiments on animal models. 
uh, connect to the front end board is the neural signal acquisition device. Its main function is to communicate with chips on the front end board, configure acquisition parameters, and receive the neural signal data stream from the front end board. All chips send data to the acquisition board in parallel. Uh, the acquisition device receives and processes all the data flows in parallel. The data is then packaged and sent to the host computer. And after uh, the technical preparation is completed, uh, we began to collect high throughput neural information from the monkey brain. The top video from left to right shows the acquisition of neural signals from the macaque brain. The anesthetized monkey lies just on the left, no photograph. Uh, the figure to the left uh, of the three pictures on the lower side shows six front end board, each supporting uh, 256 channels. Uh, the middle picture shows two acquisition devices, each support uh, 1024 channels. Uh, the right picture shows the graphic user interface of the acquisition software. Uh, where the two acquisition devices run at the same time and send data to the host computer. The waveform of the raw signal is being displayed online. From the picture uh, on the left of the free page, we can see that the thousand channel electrode is not small. The solid protective cap is very important. The animation of the right shows the complete set of implant procedure and system tools. From the bottom to top, including implanting and fixing the center ray base and the protect, protective cap. Okay, after we started uh, to collect high channel corner neural signals, okay, there are two online displays at the host computer screen. One is the band test filter raw data waveform. This approach contributes to a quality inspection of the collected signals, such as a small window in the lower left corner of the video above uh, displays a typical neural spiking waveform, uh, indicating that we did acquire the neural activity with single neural precision. If one channel acts as one information uh, dimension, then hundreds of dimensions of information are continuous, uh, collected, co collected continuously. To easily observe the activity of this neural population, we reduce them to display a dynamic in 3D space. The trajectory represents the activity at a neural population level. Okay. This page is focused on simple behavior analysis based on video capture. We do much uh, multi-camera based modeling of the macaque locomotion tracking. Okay. Uh, the immediate reason for this is that we can establish the correlation or even the causality of neural population activity to the actions. Okay, finally, I'd like to present a video of our brain machine interface monkey training procedure. The monkey chair habituation, uh, neural sensor implantation, neural signal acquisition, a uh, robot arm feeding, and a neural signal uh, control the feeding. We can see the video clearly. That's the signal from the monkey board. Okay, this is uh, <coughs> data collected from the recording system. And show on the screen uh, offline. This is spike sorting uh, open source software, when, and we add some new features to it. And clearly see the uh, single spiking waveform. This is the BMI monkey. You can see the cap on the head, and also a lot of cables connected to the cap. And the, the robot arm are grabbing the food and feed the monkey. Then the, the arm basically run the action automatically. 
and then at another light hem, uh, light brain, uh, uh, action control software. Also develop some algorithm to control, uh, the robotic arm. And then the monkey knows that, uh, the arm can just really grab through it and feed it. Then the monkey try to just control the robotic arm to grab food and uh, release the food. But the, now the older, uh, uh, the grabbing action only the start to grab and uh, uh, release the food. That's the two part of this. Okay, let's go. Thank you for your attention. Okay, Professor Gao, I'm done. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for your nice talk. <laughs> you know, we have okay. time, so your talk is just uh, uh, closed here. Okay, thank you again. Thank you. So next, uh, uh, we invite uh, uh, Dr. Zhou Xiaopu from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, the talk title is Deep Learning Method for Polygenic uh, Risk Analysis and Prediction for Alzheimer's Disease. Please, Dr. Zhu. Hello? Can you see the screen? Okay. Okay. So thanks, Professor Gao, for the kind introduction. And thanks, the organizing committee, for the hosting this great event. Good afternoon. This is Xiao Hu Zhou from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. It's my great honor to be here and present you the work on applying artificial intelligence to the genomic data for disease risk prediction and the mechanism study. This study is one of the first to in integrate an AI and the population genetics in the disease research. So we have been working on understanding the pathophysiological mechanism of Alzheimer's disease, or what we call AD. So AD patients suffer, suffering from disease, exhibiting symptoms including memory loss, cognitive decline, and language disability, with their daily activity and life quality gradually affected. Of note, AD has the high prevalence among aged people. Around half of the people over 85 or above are suffering from AD, and currently there are around 10 million AD patients in China. Also, the number of AD patients in the world are growing as the population ages, and may reach 100 million by the end of the 2050. Despite the huge number of the AD patients, currently there is no effective intervention strategy to stop or cure the disease. Thus, to prevent the social economic impact that AD might bring to the whole society, measures should be taken to find a way for the disease therapy. So indeed, the progression of the AD can last more than a decade from the cognitive normal to the dementia stage. Despite the change in happen in the brain during the progression, most patients are diagnosed too late, which make them miss the optimal time window for the disease intervention. So recent study, however, identify biomarkers, including brain imaging and proteins in body fluid, which can indicate changes in the brain at the early stage of the disease. The discovery or utility of those biomarkers offer the possibility for early risk prediction as well as the early diagnosis of the disease, so as to enable early intervention to slow down or stop the disease progression. It is striking to know that the research shows that by delaying the onset of the disease by only five years, it is estimated that we can gradually reduce the number of AD patients in the future. 
Thus, it will be critical if you can find a solution to identify people at risk for developing disease for early intervention and drug development. And over decades, genetic study conducting large population scale has identified genetic factors or mutations that are known to modulate the disease risk of AD. Specific, specifically, those genetic factors can affect the disease by influence gene specific, specific pathways that are associated with disease, either by modifying gene expression or by altering the gene function. Hence, the individual harboring those mutations will have an altered disease risk as compared to the general population. Of note, those mutations persist in individual genome since their birth and can be easily detected at any age before the disease onset. Hence, it is possible to predict the individual risk of developing disease based on the genetic information. Specifically, people with more risk variants will have a higher chance to, of developing AD in their later lives. Thus, to estimate the disease risk based on the genetic information, we need to summarize the effect from all the disease-associated variants. To resolve this, research have developed a model called the polygenic risk score model, or PRS model. In brief, this model will summarize the effect of all disease-associated variants into the single numeric value called the risk score. And for people at the high risk of developing disease or the patients, they will have a high risk score, while the others, the undemanded control or the general population will tend to have a low risk scores. So we can draw a line here and uh, separate the people at the high risk of developing disease as well as the people unlikely to develop disease at later, li later life. So that we can classify people at, uh, people at high risk for early disease risk prediction, as well as the early interventions. However, the polygenic risk score model used in the current research field have certain limitations. First, the model cannot perfectly deal with the interaction effect among groups of variants, which result in inaccurate estimation of individual variety risk of developing disease. Second, the current model can only summarize the effect of multivariance into the single numeric value that is the risk score. Well, this single value may not be able to represent the effect of polygenic risk onto multiple independent biological processes happen in different tissue or cells. However, the deep learning model, specifically the neural network model or the multilayer perceptual, which can better handle the nonlinear effect in the high dimensional, dimensional data, just like the genomic data we are dealing with, which may provide a higher prediction accuracy for the disease risk. Moreover, the structure has the, some of the intermediate layers and the output from the nodes of those intermediate layers can summarize the effect of multiple disease associated variants into distinct categories. Those categories may possibly capture the risk effect of the progeny risk onto different domains of a biological process. Well, till now, there has been no study investigating the utility of deep learning models in classifying or predicting the risk of common disease, especially AD, which is known as heritable disorder. Thus, we asked the question about if deep learning method can improve the current polygenic risk score analysis or maybe the risk prediction in human disease, particularly the AD. Specifically, we would like to understand if the deep learning method can be used to predict the disease risk, as well as to investigate the underlying disease mechanism caused by the polygenic risk. To answer those questions, we have evaluated the performance of deep learning model in classifying AD risk in several cohort recruits from the European descent population, with a total number of more than 10,000 people. Meanwhile, we have also performed an analysis in addition of 3,000 Chinese people, again to examine if deep learning model can be used for AD classification, as well as to explore its utility in cover the disease mechanism. So in our analysis, 
We have also select different number of variants for model construction by applying different filtering criteria on the association p-values with the disease. So as, it, so as to evaluate if deep learning method can also be applied to different scenarios. So first, we examine the potential deep learning model for classifying AD by training the model using all the participants from the European desert population. We measure the model accuracy using the area under the ROC curve with the value that more close to one indicate the greater classification accuracy for AD. So from the data, we can see that generally a better classification accuracy can be achieved if more variants are included for the model construction. And compared to the other two models, the weighted polygenic risk score model and the Lasso model, the neural network model achieved the significantly high accuracy. Well, we also observed that the close to perfect prediction in the current model suggests that there might be some overfitting in the neural network model during the training process. Thus, we again evaluate the model performance using the five-fold cross-validation strategy. In brief, the model will be constructed and trained in 80% of the data. And the performance of the obtained model will be further evaluated in the remaining 20% of the data. Again, we observe that a better classification accuracy can be achieved with more variance will improve for the model construction. Meanwhile, the neural network model again achieves significant higher accuracy as compared to both the weight polygenic risk score model as well as the Lasso model. Well, in a real scenario, when we apply the genetic test to the general population for the early risk prediction of AD, we will first construct a model based on the collected data from hospital or clinics, and then apply the model to the general population for the risk prediction. In order to mimic such discrepancy between the in-house data set and the general population on the disease risk predictions, we further test the performance of the model by training the model using two of our study cohorts, the ADC and the RID, and to verify the model performance in another cohort that is any. Again, we observe that the neural ne network model is a higher AD classification accuracy in both two cohorts, the ADC and the RID, as well as the any cohort that were used for the independent validation. So those data suggest that the deep learning model can indeed be used for prediction AD risk based on the genetic information, which possibly will also have a higher risk, a higher accuracy compared to other existing models. Well, the above results were obtained in the European decent populations. So we further test the performance of deep learning model for classifying AD in the Chinese population. So again, we show that the deep learning model is high accuracy for AD classification in the Chinese population. Moreover, by visualizing the distribution of the predicted risk score obtained from the model, we can see that most of the AD patients will classify into the upper tail that is with the higher risk score. And most of the normal controls were classified into the lower tail, that is with the lower risk scores. So we fitted the score distribution of this three group people into the, into the multivariant Gaussian distribution, which separate the people into the three strata, denoted as the low, median, and high risk. And we noticed that the 80 patients they were most enriched in the high risk group, while the normal control will classify into the low risk group. This suggests that the obtained model derived from the neural network model can indeed be used for classifying AD in the Chinese population. Also, as the AD progression is accompanied with the cognitive decline, we further test if the obtained risk score is also correlated with the individual cognitive performance in the study populations. So we found that the individual with the high risk score, they tend to 
show that significant lower cognitive performance comparing the people with the low risk score. And this effect is consistent observed in all participants. The non-80 participants uh, to include undemented normal control and uh, mild cognitive impairment people, as well as that APOE 3 carrier that's with the lower risk of developing AD in the general population, and also the APOE 4 carrier that is with the high risk of developing AD in the general population. Thus, in addition to the AD classification, the obtained risk score can also predict the individual community status in the elderly people. So taken together, in this part of the work, we demonstrate that deep learning model can be used for modeling the polygenic risk. In particular, comparing to the existing model, the deep learning model can achieve the better performance in classifying AD risk. Meanwhile, the risk score obtained from deep learning model can also predict the individual cognitive performance in the elderly populations. So next, we would like to examine how the AD polygenic risk score may modulate disease risk, or how the model actually works in the human samples. So we know that amyloid tau and neurodegeneration are three pathological harm hallmarks of AD, which change and progress along the disease progression in the patient's brain. Specifically, the plasma A beta level and the A beta, A, A beta ratio and tau phosphate 1A1 and FL has been shown to well correlate with those changes happen in the brain, which can also be used for the AD diagnosis. So hence, we first test if the obtained risk score correlate with the level of plasma ATM biomarkers. So interestingly, we found that a significant negative correlation between the risk score and plasma A beta 42 or the A beta ratio. Also, the score is strongly positive correlated with the phosphatol 1A1 and the NFL levels. However, when we stratify the individual by their phenotype labels, those associations only remain significant in the normal control peoples. As show, also shown in the right panel. Thus, our data suggests that AD polygen risk potentially modulate the plasma ATM biomarker and their associated phenotype changes in people who have not yet developed AD. Next, to further characterize the effect of the AD polygen risk on to the biological status, we conducted the association analysis between the SD AD risk score as well as the level of plasma protein in normal controls. So among more than three 100 plasma protein we have analyzed, we identified there are total 80 plasma protein that significant correlate with the AD protein risk score. Specifically, there will be protein that associated with the cholesterol metabolism, the PRTP, as well as the immune molecules that are involved in the inflammation, which is the CCL19. Furthermore, Gene ontology analysis suggests that the AD protein risk may modulate the TNF alpha and cytokine related pathways, as well as the network that associates TNF alpha function. So those suggesting that the protein risk may, may somehow modulate the immune associated events in the peripheral system. So notably, it is noted that the protein risk summarizes the effect of multiple variance into a single, ver si single, single score, which may not be able to capture the whole biological process change in the, in the body system. Well, the, the output from the intermediate layer actually can stratify the, the effect of variance in distinct categories. Thus, we retrieve output from the finals in the second last year layer of our neural network model and perform the association analysis with the plasma biomarker. Accordingly, we found that there are over 300 plasma proteins that have been clustered into four clusters that can be modulated by the AD protein risk. Moreover, gene ontology and cell type enrichment analysis revealed that those plasma proteins modulated by the polygen risk associated with these team immune pathways as well as the specific blood cells. Thus, 
Our result also suggests the utility of deep learning model in disease mechanism study. So taken together, our current work is then the utility of deep learning model from polygenic risk analysis to disease mechanism study, providing a possible solution when investigating the role of a genetic factor in both health and disease. Particularly, we show that polygenic risk play a critical role in modifying AD-associated pathways in people who have not yet developed AD. Also, the AD polygenic risk can potentially modulate specific immune-associated pathways in a cell type specific manner. Those evidence collectively suggest the possible involvement of immune-associated pathway in the AD pathogenesis and the utility of deep learning model in both basic research and clinical applications. So this project was contributed by researchers from multiple research institutes and research domains. And part of the analysis was obtained from the DBK and any database. And we have used the top M imputation server for imputation of the data we collect from the Caucasian populations. Uh, here's the picture of the beautiful sea view from the Hong Kong campus, which I'm currently working. So we'll be extremely happy to work on you here. And that's all. Thank you for the lesson. Okay. Thank you for your nice talk. Uh, due to there's no more time, so we have a the discussion there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. So we right now move to, to the last speaker, uh, Dr. Gaofei from University of Macau. Uh, the title of his talk is How the Human Brain Encodes the Morphological Constraint During No Alphabetical Language Word Reading. Please, Dr. Gao. Yes, thank you, Professor Gao. Thank you for your introduction. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, professors. Um, I am Dr. Gaofei from Center for Cognitive and Brain Sciences uh, at the University of Macau. Uh, today, I'm very glad to present my recent work at the 2022 Beijing Brain Conference, uh, which is titled How the Brain Encodes the Morphological Constraints During Non-Alphabetic Language Word Reading. As you can see, my research work focused on um, brain imaging and the language processing in the human brain. My presentation will cover four parts, background, methods, results, and discussion, and uh, finally, a summary. Uh, first of all, as is known to all, Chinese language is spoken by the biggest population in the world. Uh, therefore, it is important to know how Chinese language is read, processed, and learned by language users. However, the scientific studies already have been preoccupied by alphabetic systems, especially English. Importantly, Chinese language, based on its high contrast with alphabetic systems, could uh, support or qualify conclusions uh, from alphabetic systems. Therefore, Chinese reading research could inform an universal science of reading to a great extent. So the key concept uh, of this study is a specific component of human language system, that is morphology. So what is morphology? Morphology is concerned with the study of words, how they are formed and their interrelationship to with each other. For example, in English, we have singular form uh, dog and we have plural form of dog that is dogs. So we use S to mark the uh, number change. And also we uh, use S to mark the third person singular form of the verbs. And these changes were called inflection because they were, uh, these changes were used to mark a uh, grammatical change. For example, number, tense, person. However, the meaning of this word were not changed. And also we have some, uh, some, uh, some words like, uh, hiker, which is transform, transformed from hike, uh, from hike to hiker. 
the mini, both the mini and the, the word form are changed. And this type of morphology is called a derivation. Also, we have another type, uh, which is uh, compound. Uh, in this case, black plus uh, board, black plus board makes blackboard, which is a new word. So that's uh, how we define morphology. But why do we want to study morphology and the morphology in the human brain? Uh, from this seminal work in 2002, uh, um, titled The Faculty of Language, What is it? Who has it? And how did it evolve? by Hasser, Nochomsky, and Fish. They compared the language system between uh, human brain and animals. Here, Chomsky uh, claimed that the faculty of language in the narrow sense only includes recursion and is the uh, only uniquely human component of the faculty of language. Recursion in Chinese, we call it di gui. So what, what is recursion? Recursion is the repeated sequential use of a particular type of linguist, linguistic element or grammatical structure. Uh, in other words, recursion is the uh, embedment of structure. In that sense, morphology or word structure is a recursion at a word and a morpheme level. So get to know how morphology is enabled and constrained is in the human brain, it's very important to know our human language faculty. Uh, how do our human brain encode morphological information? Uh, here we come to the concept of morphological processing. Morphological processing involves operations on internal morphemic information as well as the structure of a given word. Uh, in most cases, morphological processing is intertwined with semantic analysis. For example, uh, morphological processing is concerned with internal morphemic information, whether the target word is processed holistically or in decomposed uh, form. And also, uh, scholars are interested in sublexical information processing, for example, phonology, orthography. Uh, semantics, uh, among others. And the other important aspect of morphological processing is morphological structure, as we have um, reviewed in English studies, that is inflection, derivation, and compound. However, uh, in Chinese language, the case is very different. As we all know, there are not much inflection like uh, plural form S or third cert a uh, person, singular, word, verbal form, S. Uh, in Chinese, we don't have such inflections. Instead, we uh, have monomorphic word like uh, putao, and we have derivations a little bit. And uh, the majority of Chinese language are compound words. Given the fact that more than 70% of Chinese words are formed by compounding two or three constitute morphemes, written Chinese is often described as morphosyllabic. However, how human brain processes the morphological structure information in Chinese reading is still poorly understood. To address this issue, we identified two specific uh, research gaps. The first research gap is that the dynamic signature of Chinese morphological processing in the human brain is still unclear. Uh, there are two contrasting accounts. The first one is early processing account, which holds that, uh, which found that besides semantic and vocabulary effect, morphological structure effect was only obtained in the time window of P250. Also, morphological structure might automatically modulate semantic processing in the early stage of compound word reading. Uh, on the contrary, uh, there is another account called the post-lexical processing account. They believe they found that words of higher morphological productivity elicited a significantly bigger P600 effect than those of low morphological productivity. These authors therefore interpreted the P600 effect as a late reanalysis on structural productivity, productivity on morphological structure information, which might suggest a conscious processing on Chinese compound word. 
And the second research gap is concerned with the spatial localizations of Chinese morphological processing uh, in the human cerebral cortex. The, some scholars found that the lexical access, access and the morphological awareness has been found to involve the semantic neural network, including the ventral inferior frontal gyrus and the middle temporal gyrus. Uh, specifically, Ye and his colleagues revealed that the morphological structure task uh, were associated with stronger activations in the dorsal, IFG, and posterior SD, as uh, we can see from the figure on the right, uh, also in ventral IFG and posterior MTG as compared to phenological judgment task. These findings were taken together to suggest that Chinese morphological processing engages both the left frontal and temporal cortex, which are sensitive, sensitive to the salient uh, morphosyllabic feature of Chinese language. However, these findings were based on the contrast between auditory and visual tasks. Uh, it's still unclear whether this neural pattern would remain in reading process or whether it's only sensitive to modality. To address these two specific research gaps, we designed a study to explore the spatial temporal brain activation patterns associated with morphological constraint encoding during Chinese compound word reading. We designed the visual lexical design task, task with Chinese disyllabic compound words, pseudo words, and non words. To capture both uh, temporal and spatial information of morphological constraint encoding, we used the uh, EEG and apneas uh, simultaneously to describe both the when and how information on Chinese morphological processing. The rationale uh, is as follows. We use a comparison between real, real words and pseudo words to denote morphological difficulty or sensitivity because pseudo words are the key materials of our design because uh, pseudo words were those uh, uh, which are interpretable semantically, yet when readers were trying to map this uh, string onto the lexical entry in their mental lexicon, they might encounter some structural problem. Uh, on the other hand, we use uh, contrast between real pseudo words and non words to denote the semantic processing, and we will compare these two uh, processes in the word reading pro process. We recruited 30 Chinese native speakers. Uh, they were college students and right-handed, uh, normal or corrected to normal vision, and they reported no neurological illness or mental disorder. Um, for the materials, we included real words, which were high-frequency disyllabic words like heiba, and the pseudo words, which were formed by replacing a character morpheme of a compound word with a semantically related morpheme, for example. We could, and also we have non words as baseline, which were formed by combining any two characters from the data set, which turned out to be a pronounceable, meaningless, and morphological, morphologically illegal string, such as fuke. And uh, the three conditions were matched on frequency, stroke numbers, as well as morphological legality, stroke number, uh, word frequency, position frequency, character, character frequency. We used a slow event related design. Um, participants would uh, feel a fixation lasting for 500 milliseconds and then a blank lasting for 200 milliseconds, the target word for 400 milliseconds, and then a probe uh, lasting for three seconds, where participants needed to um, decide whether the target word is a real word or not by uh, pressing the corresponding buttons. And then later on, a uh, red fixation lasting for 12 seconds, which allows the hemodynamic responses coming back to a resting state. To capture um, temporal spatial information of morphological uh, constraint encoding, we uh, used the simultaneous EEG and FNIRS uh, signal acquisition. So we use brain products 
um, 32 channels to acquire EG data and the near X system to acquire AppNews data, which consists of uh, eight sources and eight detectors. Uh, that's forming 22 measurement ch channels uh, covering the left frontal and temporal cortex, uh, which is associated with uh, language comprehension and processing. Uh, let's look at the behavior results. Uh, from both reaction time and uh, accuracy, we can see pseudo words were the most difficult material because they have the reaction, uh, longest reaction time as well as the lowest uh, accuracy, which, which is in line with our prediction because pseudo words uh, involves both morphological constraints as well as semantic operations. Uh, for ERP results, we firstly focused on N400 effect, which is associated with semantic processing. Uh, from the results, we can see semantic processing was manifested in N400 uh, in both the contrast between non-words and real words, as well as non-words versus pseudo-words. Following info handler, we also identify the uh, LAN effect, that is the uh, left anterior negativity, which is associated with uh, structural problem or processing in light of previous studies. So from the results within this time window, we found the semantic uh, processing between non-words and uh, real words. Importantly, we identified we identified a morphological sensitivity effect uh, between pseudo words and uh, real words. But we can say so this morphological effect is later than the semantic effect. Also, we uh, analyze the FNIRS uh, results to see the brain activation patterns. Uh, interestingly, we found the morphological sensitivity is mainly distributed in the left uh, prefrontal cortex. Uh, especially the IFG. On the contrary, semantic processing was manifested in the left uh, temporal cortex, which is in line with uh, previous studies on children and uh, auditory materials. So based on our ERP readouts, the brain difference at uh, N400 effect between non-words and real words might reflect the semantic uh, analysis at the morphemic level in favor of a sublexical decomposition account. Pseudo words generated a significantly larger than than real words, which suggests a sensitivity to morphological status in complex word recognition. Therefore, we conclude that morphological constraint encoding might relate to a top-down conscious and controlled neural basis. From the FDR's activation results, uh, we can see that spatial activation revealed a dissociation between neural engagements or morphological parsing and the semantic analysis. To be more specific, morphological parsing is uh, primarily located at the left uh, FG, while semantic analysis was mainly associated with activation in the left uh, temporal cortex, including the MTG. The current study therefore extended ex existing findings by suggesting that the left uh, IFG is also prominent in reading single Chinese words involving morphological constraints. And this activation is evident regardless of the language modalities. To sum up, morphological constraints of Chinese words involve the later stage of lexical processing and the left prefrontal cortex plays an important role in this process. Uh, from the perspective of methodology, EG avenues diffusion could provide a viable tool to examine the when and where information in reading process. In the future, more work could be done to manifest the neural patterns of morphological processing across different languages, modalities, and populations. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank my supervisor, Professor Yuan Zhen and Professor Cecilia Zhao, and my collaborators in, from BFCU, University of Macau, University of Bergen. Thank you for your support. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you for your nice talk. Uh, due to the, some no more time, so we haven't the discussions.
Thank so you. So that's all. Okay. Okay. Uh, all the speaker has finished their talks right now. So we thank all the speakers for their nice talk and for the audience for the listening. So we our our uh, session will be closed right now. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.